Hi, I'm Andrew Sharp. I'm a consultant cardiologist from Cardiff in the United Kingdom. It's my great pleasure to be joined by Felix Mafoud, a friend and colleague from Hamburg, soon to be Basel in Switzerland. So congratulations. Thank you. Um, we're here at EuroPCR and we are talking about renal denervation. So we've got packed rooms here. There's a lot of interest. And that's partly stimulated by the recent inclusion of renal denervation as an approved therapy in the document of the ESH, the European Society of Hypertension, in their guidelines of 2023. It's now approved for routine clinical use in Europe. And it's also been approved by the US FDA for routine treatment in the United States. So this has been a long, drawn out <laughs> period of our careers, right? We're talking 12, 13 exactly, years yeah. of trying to build the sham control evidence that's led to these approvals. We're now at the practical stage. Yeah. So we're going to talk a little bit about the practicalities of running a service. So how do you select and work up patients in order to get the right patients safely into the lab for renal denervation? The landscape changed, you mentioned it. It's now recommended by guidelines uh, mm -hmm. to consider renal denervation at least. And I think there are two groups of patients that are uh, candidates for renal denervation, or at least two groups of patients. One, one group consists of patients who are difficult to control on two, three or four antihypertensive drugs where secondary causes of hypertension have been excluded. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, these patients are really difficult to be managed with uh, lifestyle modification and, uh, and antihypertensive drugs. So that's, sure, that's, a big, that's a big group of yeah. patients. And the other, other cohort consists of patients who are either unable or unwilling to tolerate antihypertensive drugs. And we all know these patients, yeah. right? Also very difficult to control and to convince that antihypertensive mm. drugs are important to lower their blood pressure. They don't tolerate them or they're just not willing to adhere to a lifelong therapy. So two major groups of patients that are for, for me, myself, and also for the guidelines, I think best candidates for renal denervation at current stage. And both groups are at risk of stroke, you know? Absolutely. So we've had these debates. What if a patient says, I don't like these drugs, they make me feel unwell, I don't want to take them. They're at risk, just Absolutely. like the resistant hypertension Absolutely. group are. Andrew, in the trials, we have seen very low safety events, right? Yeah, extremely so Very yeah. low. So the procedure is really safe yeah. and, and was delivered safe. So what's, what's your take on these trials? And if you want to transfer that to clinical practice, how to set up best practice yes. for, to carry out the procedure indeed in patients with uncontrolled blood pressure? Yeah. So in the sham control trials, we took sort of what we might call middle-aged patients, patients in their 50s plus or minus 10 years. Uh, these are patients you'd expect maybe to have healthier arteries than if we took patients in their 80s, which uh, maybe not the best group to start with. Um, so uh, first of all, we got to safely get vascular access. We were really pleased, weren't we, with the trials and the low rates of vascular yeah. complications. How was that done? It was done with ultrasound-guided femoral arterial access, assisted with fluoroscopy. A lot of sites were using micropuncture technique with a four French device, such that they could confirm they were in the right place over the femoral head, compressible um, access point, and then upsize. It's a six French for one device, seven French for another. And so these are not large bore access. Yeah. And you and I have been trained in TAVA, right, in TAVI. So we, we now got used to getting vascular access in a different way, certainly compared to when I started my career. Uh, the next thing is the safe and appropriate use of contrast. So I think this is on our minds now from the uh, ultra low contrast PCI techniques that every use of contrast is important. And so we have been able to minimize those in the real world, less than half the contrast use in the clinical trials. The appropriate use of guide wires that are not hydrophilic. That's an important aspect. Yeah. Very important. So we need a supportive wire to deliver the available devices. But what we don't want is something like a whisper extra support. We don't want a super slippy wire that's going to be poking into the end of the arterioles of the renal bed. Um, and then after that, anticoagulation, sedation. As, you, as yeah. you know, you need someone to handle the sedation during these procedures. And so I allocate a nurse in the lab whose job it is just to do sedation. And I think you do the same. Uh, and then closure devices. So I think there's some mixed data going back 10, 15 years, but vascular closure devices, I think, make it safer and certainly allow these patients to be day case procedures. So are you, are you treating these patients as a day case? You're sending them home the same day? I think medically and clinically, we can certainly consider this being yeah. an outpatient procedure, a one-day yeah. procedure. Yeah. But for, for various reasons, we treat them in hospital, overnight stay, and, and then they're sent home typically the day after. Yeah. Uh, one thing I should mention as well is if you have a heav heavily atheromatous renal arteries, they're not the good candidates for renal denervation. If you've had previous stenting, I know we've got some research data um, suggesting that as long as you're outside the stent, that's okay. But we don't want these. What we want people to take at the beginning of their programs are patients who've got nice straightforward yeah. renal anatomies, 
who've got either resistant hypertension or uncontrolled hypertension with drug intolerance and, and just take pretty much vanilla yeah. patients, straightforward patients. You, know, no you were talking now about acute procedural safety, but what, are, what about long-term renal yeah. artery safety? Any concerns there that renal no, artery no. stenosis may, may occur? No, it's very gratifying. So um, we were both involved in a paper led by Ray Townsend that was published in Neurointervention in 2020, looking at the safety of RF in over 5,000 patients. And it's remarkably safe. It's not so different, the uh, new renal artery stenosis rate from a, a de novo hypertensive population where atherosclerosis would just run on anyway. It's about 0.2% per year, so a tiny amount. And, um, and half of those were not even at the site of denovation. This is just the progression of atherosclerosis. Renal function, as you know, it always declines yeah. with age, but uh, we've not seen anything out of the ordinary. In fact, by reducing blood pressure, there's a signal maybe we could slow that decline. Yeah. So um, when we started out this field, you and I were both wondering, is this going to be safe in the long term? We've now got 10 year follow up. You've, you've released 10 year follow up. Congratulations. Uh, as, as a group from Australia, uh, showing very good safety and durability of the effect of denervation. So, so no, no indication of, of re right? Re yeah. Regrowth of nerve, yes. nerves, which may then cause a secondary rise in blood pressure, which is reassuring, yeah. not yeah. only for us, but even more so for patients. Like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Ultimately, it's about blood pressure, yeah. right? and it's coming down and staying down, yeah. and we've now got 10-year follow-up. Yeah. Um, so uh, if, if um, people out there are setting up services, how, how should they follow them up? How do you follow them up, and how would you recommend they follow them up? So we typically uh, see these patients three months after the procedure again, and then on a yearly basis, it's, yeah. you know, the procedure is really safe. Renal artery stenosis, as you mentioned, the risk of renal artery stenosis is very, very low probably at the risk of natural progression of, of renal artery stenosis in hypertensive individuals. It's more about adjusting medical therapy in mm. some patients, checking mm. for EGFR. You know, it's like a regular visit that we see patients on a yearly basis with uh, difficult to control hypertension. Yes. Exactly the same I would recommend yes. uh, for patients post renal denervation. Yeah, I mean, I, I describe it as RDN as simple but not easy, yeah. in that you've got to work to set up the structures and then it will work on its own. Absolutely. But you've got to be trained properly, you've got to be in a team, yeah. you've got to uh, focus on the right selection, the right patients, safe procedure, good follow-up. Okay, so thanks very much. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, we're going to be a lot more conversation about this at this conference and in the years to come. This is now a clinical procedure. If you're interested, get involved, form a hypertension team in your hospital, get trained. There's a lot of patients out there with uncontrolled blood pressure that need new options. Thanks very much.